You know what they say? That which does not kill us makes us stronger. Hey y'all, today we are joined by Anne Corey. This is Phyllis Schlafly's daughter, Phyllis Schlafly being the prominent anti-feminist during the ERA battle, the 60s, 70s, and the fictionalized star of the Mrs. America show streaming on FX on Hulu. Last time we talked to Mrs. Corey, she was talking to us about the news that the show would be streaming. So now the show is streaming and all nine episodes have aired. My subscribers told me that I should review each episode. I think they hate me. (laughs) It's dark. I don't think they like me very much. (laughs) But I, I decided to go ahead and take the challenge and review each episode. I am working on my second review, which will be, uh, combining the second and third episode. So I'm working on that right now. It's almost finished. It will actually come out on my channel before this interview does. And then I'll continue to review each episode, grouping most of them together because it's a lot. So I have been keeping up with your interviews. I've been watching uh, on the Eagle Forum channel. You've been going through each episode with... uh, Oh, what was her name? Colleen Holcomb. Yes. How's that going? I still have the last two to do. <laughs> it's a lot to work through. <laughs> well, there's a lot packed in each episode. And, and it's a question of, do you take down every inaccuracy and talk about it? I mean, remember, it's fiction. And it's their view of what a conservative woman would be. And they've made her you know, pretty dark and power mad and unhappy and I it's uh, it's unfortunate that that is what lives in the Hollywood uh, um, uh, it, it lives out there for people to get a perception on it but I also hope that it gives people an opportunity to learn the true history because I think it's a better story I absolutely agree actually I, I'm not an optimistic person when it comes to retelling of history usually I I don't like that narrative of, well, well, at least we're getting our message out because, okay, well, you're getting your message out, but it's been taken by the Hollywood left and they can do whatever they want to with it. Mm -hmm. But I have heard from a couple of people that they're, they're looking further into the truth of Phyllis because of the show. Have you seen the same? I have because really young women wouldn't know this story. They never heard of her. It's uh, it's new history to them. And because we have to give credit where credit's due, Kate Blanchett is a very good actress and she, she comes across as an interesting person. So I, I hope that that has encouraged people to find out the uh, story of Phyllis Schlafly because I think she was a role model and she had a life worth emulating. Definitely. I would agree. So thank you for taking this time to come back again. I think this is the third time I've actually Mm -hmm. interviewed you. The first time was on the phone, just answering a few questions. With pleasure, Lacey. (laughs) Well, thank you. You're very generous with your time, so I appreciate it. I also appreciate that you want to protect the legacy of your mother. Well, and it's not just my mother. And, And, you know, that's one of the things that's missed in this. My mother had success because her message resonated with millions of women. And the attack that Hollywood is doing on Phyllis Schlafly is really an attack on conservative women. So it's the millions of women who admired Phyllis Schlafly or who believe in in the message that she have or who today live a conservative life. They're the ones who are being attacked by Hollywood, and they're the ones who today need defending because Hollywood still sees them as a threat. Absolutely. That's one of the things that the producer, uh, Davi Waller, I think that's how you pronounce it, she actually said that. She said, don't we want to, and this, this was in my first review, so I'm probably not quoting exactly, but she said, don't we want to understand her allure so we can stop it from happening the second time. Well, we know where she came from in her point of view (laughs) and why the message in the movie is so skewed. Yes. And what I find interesting is they don't, they don't shy away from their message. I honestly thought it would be more subtle than it is. 
Uh, Weren't you surprised on how they took abortion on so head on? That abortion and the uh, being against housewives. I, I mean, I, the third wave feminist rhetoric is we don't hate housewives. You're just making that up. Um, which they, if they really believe that, they didn't read the literature from earlier feminists who said just that. But the, yes. the, the abortion rhetoric and the anti-housewife rhetoric, mm -hmm. they're very comfortable. And I'm wondering, do you think they're overplaying their hand? In, in a lot of ways, yes, I do. Because, uh, because they, the feminists in the movie don't come off very well. I mean, even the one they glamorize, Gloria Steinem, and they really glamorize every aspect about her. And the, you know, it, it, she's in soft focus, and they they uh, they they slow down the camera every time she sh she's on camera. But she comes across as so shallow and vain, uh, and and of course disloyal. And and I think and this, all the characters on on the um, in the feminists have these deep problems and getting along with each other. And, and it's, it doesn't, it sort of ends up, which group would you rather go out to dinner with? Right. The communist agenda as well is very apparent in being anti-male, anti-family, uh, anti-children. And I, I'm just watching this kind of shocked that they think they can, like the communists aren't scared anymore. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they used to try to subtly do things that people didn't notice. And I know Phil has talked about this once before I heard in a speech that they would take traditional roles for women as career choices, like, you know, full-time homemaker, full-time mother, they would take those out of the history books. And that was their subtle way of, and they would change the language, you know, make it more gender neutral and, and, uh, and school books and so the, these subtle ways that they have been working towards a gender neutral society, they're not so subtle about anymore. No, no, no. It was full on uh, with their agenda in this show, which is, uh, which is a value. It's, it can be a teaching lesson then. I mean, one of the things that I noticed right off in the first episode, uh, which, is, which is the sex scenes. I mean, they portray merit, marital sex as nasty, brutish, and short, and uh, single sex as as thrilling and exciting, and especially when it's um, when you're cheating on your boyfriend. I, I, I mean, it, it's just amazing to me that they think that that kind of play will resonate with people, uh, because you know, would you rather be in a um, a faithful, long term relationship, or would you rather have a series of um, of uh, wild uh, extremes and end up with nobody. Right. So that leads into our next question. Speaking of the more intimate scenes, I'm sure that as an adult child, seeing your parents' marriage being depicted on television in any way would be traumatic and hard to watch and very upsetting. Uh, how do you feel as a child of these people being depicted on television to watch their marriage betrayal? Well, it's fictional. I mean, what they portray didn't happen. And I know it didn't happen because my bedroom was next to their bedroom. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I knew their marriage very well. And uh, it's, uh, they had a, they very much had a partnership and a loving marriage. And there, there was no, um, the, their relationship was fully integrated because they were on, they, I call it two peas in a pot. They, they supported each other um, they, uh, intellectually and emotionally and spiritually. And uh, my father was so proud of his mother, of his, excuse me, of, my, of his wife. Um, and, and I think one of the things this show misses is humor. My father had a very good sense of humor, and he enjoyed you know, calling himself or being called Mr. Phyllis. And he liked to say, I regret that I have but one wife to give to my country. And it always got a laugh. But I, I think what we're seeing in this show is, um, 
they'll they've used some of his lines and they they treat him seriously as as opposed to getting his humor that's really heartwarming to hear actually they do that with phyllis too uh the last i think it was the last episode she said one of my favorite lines and i'd like to thank my husband fred for letting me come out tonight because it because she said that because it angered the feminists and but she also said it because she realized there was only one person in her life that was important to her to, that she wanted to please, and that was her husband. And if, if your husband is the most important person in your life, then why wouldn't you honor him by talking to him about going and uh, about your travel plans? Why, if, if he wanted you to stay home, why wouldn't you honor that, that uh, request? Because he is the most important person in your life. Absolutely. And I'll have you know that I gave a speech once and I said, this would not, this speech would not be complete if I didn't start out with my favorite Phil Schlafly quote. <laughs> <laughs> so I thanked my husband for allowing me to get out and speak. <laughs> but well, um, I mean, there's a support mechanism there. I, you know, that, and, and that is what makes a successful marriage beautiful, is because you are considerate and supportive of each other. Absolutely. I agree. And, and they treat that line in the episode the same as they treated your father's lines, you know, super seriously. Um, it, it was not delivered in the same humorous manner. So... You know, yes, that's right, because Kate Blanchett does, does not have a sense of humor in this production. No, not at all. I think a lot of, there are a lot of people who have written that this movie portrays Phyllis Schlafly as a mommy dearest. And, uh, and she comes across as mean and power mad. But, but, you know, my mother was a human being, you know, she, you know, she had she had pluses and she had minuses. She had faults uh, and she had good points. I mean, that is the way we all are. Um, but uh, but she did have success in her life, and her part of her success was exposing the feminist ideology as ultimately harmful to women. And for that, she is still being vilified. And so I think it is well worth uh, explaining that that. The Hollywood producers have an ulterior motive, uh, and and that is why they want to portray a woman uh, not accurately, but in their own vision, trying to uh, for them imagining what a conservative woman might be like or what her home life would be like. Uh, and there were some things that they did in this production that were accurate. Uh, you know, they the the set of my the house I grew up in. I, you know, even down to the tea kettle on the stove is quite mm -hmm. accurate. Oh, that's fascinating. I want to know mm -hmm. which tea kettle, the tea kettle on the stove. I'll have to go yeah, back. Yeah, there's only that. one tea kettle on the stove, and it, it lives in okay. a dead ringer for the tea kettle that was on our I, stove. <laughs> I have loved enjoying, I, I've enjoyed uh, watching the the 70s aesthetic and the, the clothes. Mm -hmm. and the they spent a lot of time getting things very right on that. Well, I, Dobby Waller worked on Mad Men, who mm -hmm. uh, apparently Mad Men, I, I've seen interviews of the production and the, the set designers and things like, uh, people like that. And they put a lot of time and effort into actually getting everything so accurately. So I know she, she was in that project as well. And now she's doing this. So if, if for nothing else, it is a beautiful show aesthetically. <laughs> but, uh, so this is what is on everybody's minds. I have to ask the hard hitting questions, okay? Yeah. Okay. Did you get left at school? Oh, <laughs> well, I thought you were gonna ask, did I get thrown in the pool? I didn't, I did not get thrown in the pool. But, uh, <laughs> but my favorite part about being left at, at school, allegedly, is that I find my own way home. Yeah. I thought it showed me with some, uh, some, some moxie that I was able to figure out my own way of getting home. <laughs> I kind of like that. <laughs> no, I don't ever remember being left at school. <laughs> But I think I think the way they they try to portray that is though she um, sort of forgot that she had a child. Is that what they mean? Right. Like <laughs> she was so busy with with the activism and the Eagle Forum mm -hmm. that you know she, they work overboard, like over hard to to say that she was not a wife and mother, which mm -hmm. 
we've already talked about. Um, I mean, at no point in time is she ever in the kitchen. And I've heard a couple- Except in the very last scene. She's, she's upset that she, you know, mm-hmm. we'll get there. And you know what the problem with that is that she's uh, allegedly making baked apples, but she's peeling the whole apple. And to make a baked apple, you always leave the skin on. Was that what she was doing, making baked apples? I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't get that. <laughs> Hollywood. Yeah, she has, a, she has a baking dish that she's in front of her that she's putting the apples in after she peels them. Yeah. As though she's going to bake them in the, uh, um, in the oven. And baked apples were a favorite dish of hers. Um, that's in the cookbook. Mm-hmm. Right. So I have the cookbook now. Ah. <laughs> it's have you made easy. any recipes? I have. I've made the cheese souffle. Did it turn out? It did. I really liked it. It was really good. So I'll put the cookbook link in the description of this video. So anybody who wants to go grab that can, it was actually in the description of my last review. So So my mother did cook and she was really, actually she was a health food nut because she, she, she did farm to table long before that movement came along. And um, we did have a, a woman who worked for, for our family for 40 years named Willie B. Reed. And she was an excellent cook. And Willie B. Act, um, did publish her own cookbook of her own recipes. That's re- referred to in the final episode. Oh, that's sweet. Well, I, I, when I saw that they put somebody in your house that helped with the, the mm-hmm. was it housekeeper or maid or a cook or just somebody to help? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't have anybody to help me, so I wouldn't know what they would do. <laughs> but well, it, it's, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, there's always a lot of work to do. So it's nice to have help. Uh, and, and Willie B was a wonderful cook. Right. My grandmother actually had somebody in her house. And mm-hmm. I think that was kind of of the times, wasn't it? Didn't a lot of people have help at the time? Yes. 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 I, I mean, because my grandmother wasn't super wealthy or anything, but she did have, have help. I think, I think it was more of a thing then than it used to be, than, than it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I would want to clean my entire house before anybody came over to help me clean it. <laughs> I don't know. So the feminism topic, I think, now you can give me your perception, but I think it was oversimplified on our side. The, the anti-ERA, the, the traditional women, it was very oversimplified. And on the feminist side, you had uh, the abortion debate, which we've already talked about, was very overt. And you had uh, I mean, they talked about alimony and they just, they talked about all of these issues that they really cared about. And then you had the housewife saying, you're just being mean to us. You know, we don't mm-hmm. like that. You don't like housewives. You get this idea that that's all feminism was about. And they completely skip over all of Phyllis's arguments for uh, being against women in the draft Mm-hmm. And the- my mother had a whole list of of arguments against the Equal Rights Amendment that she regularly spouted, and of course that her supporters knew by heart. And they their arguments were legitimate, fact based changes that would happen to women if this amendment were ever put in the Constitution. And on the other side was a feel good. It would feel good if we had ERA. So it was really emotion on the other side and fact on our side. And they've done a flip on that. And so the interesting thing is, where did my mother get her facts on what would happen if ERA were put in the Constitution? She got it from a book written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg called Sex Bias in the U.S. Code. And this book, written in, I I believe, about 1975 or 76, laid out exactly all the laws that must be changed when it, if ERA were in the Constitution and had a sex neutral, um, and that the laws had to become sex neutral. 
And so this is using their own words to, to what would, and so it was completely fact-based. Right. I, I saw the same thing. I saw you talk about uh, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg book on the Eagle Forum channel. So I will also link the Eagle Forum channel in the description. There's a lot of information there when you, when you go through each episode mm -hmm. on, on those videos. So they play down her knowledge of the Equal Rights Amendment a lot. Mm -hmm. And they really oversimplify the arguments like you said it. There were a lot of things that feminists wanted to do with this amendment that they were telling us they wanted to do. Uh, starting with that book, I've watched Betty Friedan debates where she said she wanted to set up some sort of like communist economic uh, fallback plan for housewives who get divorced. It was just, it's not like we didn't have any grievances. <laughs> but don't you think ultimately it's the idea that government is better suited to make these decisions for families than parents? Right, you know, because the village is supposed to raise our children, the mm -hmm. village being the government. <laughs> Yes. But they, they and they, they pull that all the way through the oversimplification of of the of the opposition to the ERA all the way through the last episode when Alice gets a job and this is supposed to be an extreme betrayal to Phyllis that she got a job and liberating for Alice liberating for Alice and then did you notice how Phyllis said you used to be empowered by me. <laughs> Would your mom ever say that? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, my mother, my mother was certainly an encourager of women, but she, but she was not the uh, dispenser of power. You know, she encouraged women to get up and get out and have their voice and enter and enter in the the policy world. And I think, uh, Lacey, you've used the, this line. Uh, homemakers as policy makers because she always believed that the home you could have enormous power and influence right from your kitchen table and and I think the idea that Alice getting a paid job to have 400 calls a day as opposed to the 400 calls a day she was making for free because she was because she was uh, volunteering for Phyllis I mean they're, they're making this up out of whole cloth and and trying to make a neat end or summary or betrayal by this fictional character because this character never existed and and there's no basis they call alice a composite character but there's no basis in reality for for making such a character uh, i think they call they named her alice because in episode eight she's uh, alice in wonderland you know she's fallen down the uh, the the hole and uh, in this new world that where nothing makes any sense and it sure didn't make any sense in episode eight. That episode was probably one of the worst. <laughs> mm -hmm. It I I mean they actually depicted was it I, I I said this to you on the phone when we were talking just a couple of days ago. Demon Phyllis coming to Alice in a nightmare, putting her hand over and choking her. Choking her, yes. As if she's this bully who's intimidating mm -hmm. Alice into worshiping her and not being confident in herself. And you've spoken to your mom's influence on many women throughout the years and in the Eagle Foreman and encouraging women to speak up. So what would you say about your mom and, and encouraging other women? Well, she did. And I think we have many women today who do, will tell you directly that they are running the organizations they're running because Phyllis carved a path for them and encouraged them to do it and that they felt that they could get out. Because, you know, my mother was so outspoken and so vocal in way that people were, um, you know, people had a hard time uh, well, you know, do you really want to, you, you sound so extreme or some things like that, that people would be a little afraid of to, to be vocal and public that way. But because she did it and forged this path, it gave so many other women the, the confidence that they could do it themselves also. And um, the theme of this movie 
is that Phyllis was the victim of the white male patriarchy, and then she used the power that men gave her so she could squish other women so that Phyllis would have all the power. Well, <laughs> that uh, fortunately is, is fiction because the real story is the thousands of women today running conservative organizations and being active in politics. And that's who Hollywood is really afraid of. Absolutely. I agree. And I called it when, when we talked a while ago about the show, the, the news breaking about the show before it started streaming. I said, I know that they're going to play up the hypocrite angle because I, I actually didn't know about Phyllis Schlafly until she had passed. Mm -hmm. And that is how I found out about her is how I found out about it, the Eagle Forum. She was in the news. And ever since then, I've heard, well, she preached about women being in the home, but she wasn't in the home. And it's surprising to me that people still have that criticism of she wasn't in the home because she was, and she was raising children. And then she was in her 50s and going to school and then doing activism and i know last time you were on here you you spoke about how she had different chapters in her life well maybe they use that hypocrite uh reasoning because she was very youthful looking and they thought she was younger than she really was maybe it's a compliment to how pretty she was <laughs> definitely so <laughs> you and i talked about one time on the phone a little while ago a few weeks ago, probably, that the portrayal of the actual real women is not fair and balanced. The feminists have all their feminist heroes from the second wave. You know, you can name them Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, Bella Abzug, um, you can Shirley Chisholm, and then we have on the other side Phyllis and no name people. Rosemary Thompson is probably one of them. It, isn't it quite unfair to fictionalize 90% of one side and Yes, another? and I have here, Rosemary Thompson was quite a, an extraordinary woman. They're the two books that she wrote um, that, uh, and, and of course I knew her, and I recently heard from her widower who um, is so upset over the, the portrayal of his wife, who was quite accomplished, and um, a number of women in the, when, Ray, when Ronald Reagan was elected pres, uh, president, a number of my mother's key supporters did get jobs in the Reagan administration, including Rosemary Thompson, uh, who worked for many years in, in the Department of Education. So, um, so they, they you know, kind of maltreat the ones where they use their names, and they use the names of ones who have passed away. I mean, there are women still alive today who they do not, name in the in the show which um, because I think they purposely pick women who are dead because they're not there to complain about it um, I, and so they have all these fictional characters to drive the story uh, including the idea that there was a, a young mother who was being abused by her husband and Phyllis was uncaring I, you, you know the, these things are you know made up out of whole cloth and they've ignored the women who were just um, you know, really dynamic, and some of them still qu uh, continue to be at quite active today. I mean, they could have pursued these stories and fleshed out real live characters, but they chose not to. I can think of about three women off the top of my head who I met at Eagle Council who said amazing things about your mother, mm -hmm. who were there in, in these days. Uh, the beginning of it, uh, Uni Smith, the president of yes of Eagle Forum, she was there with uh, since its conception, Stop ERA, right? Yes, she is one of the original board members uh, of Eagle Forum. So you know they they ignore all of Uni's uh, um, story. Is uh, I mean, and Uni said to me, "Well, how come I'm not in this movie?" <laughs> <laughs> Poor Uni. <laughs> so, yeah, you mentioned uh, being in the the. Rosemary Thompson was in the, the Reagan administration, is that? Mm -hmm. what, what was yes, that? and so were uh, Shirley Curry and Donna Hearn, uh, and there are probably some other, oh, um, 
um, the, uh, another one. Uh, I mean, there were a number of my mother's uh, supporters who did get jobs in the Reagan administration, but they sort of try to make it that, you know, Reagan betrayed Phyllis at the end, which was not the case. So what was the case? What really happened? So I have a I have a letter that my mother wrote in December of 1980, where she announces to her supporters that she is not going to seek a position in the new administration because she feels that she has more power and influence with the grassroots mm -hmm. and working from uh, from her home because of course she never had a, an outside office she always worked from her home uh, and and I think in a lot of ways. Um, even if she had gone to Washington, it uh, it would not have been a happy fit because that was not who she was, and I think she recognized that. But um, they sort of make this idea that she wanted to be ambassador to the UN, and that completely misses that my mother fought her whole life against the United Nations. So even if they had offered her the UN, she would have said, I don't agree with that organization. America should get out of the UN, I refuse it. I mean, there's no possible way she ever would have it conceptually thought that of being an ambassador to the UN. Well, I agree with that. I do not like the UN either. But they they take this this event and they twist it just like they twisted the reason why she got started in the ERA in the first place. They they portray it as she wanted to impress these men in politics and she wanted to get the attention and be relevant in politics. But what I know about her background is that she started getting interested in the ERA because it affected national defense, which is her background, right? Yes, yes. Because she saw that drafting women and putting them in the combat front lines would weaken our military. And she wanted, she was always interested in a strong military defense of the United States. Right, which they completely skip over all of her her arguments against women in the yes. military. Well, as my mother liked to say, there's no army that the uh, American army is going to fight where they're going to have women in the front line. So why are we doing it to our women? Right, and I agree with that. So this entire series was overt and out there, not apologetic, and I remember us talking about this on the phone and you said, we're in a war. And I, I appreciate you saying that because so many people underappreciate the fight that we're up against. I've heard from a few conservatives, probably irrelevant ones, that, that, they sh that it's fictional and nobody expects it to be a documentary. Nobody expects it to be the truth. But you have time and time again gave interviews, gone on the media, set the record straight. I think the, you can never underestimate the power and influence that pop culture has. Even if you know it's fictional, the, those images stick with you and it has enormous influence down the line. And you know, people won't remember whether they saw a documentary or a fictional story, but they will remember the images and and that will influence them and so i i although i appreciate the opportunity to tell my mother's story it is still frustrating to me that hollywood wants to demonize her because i think portraying her life story as a as villainy harms young women coming up who then say, well, I can't do that. You know, I'll, you right. know I, that's obviously a bad life choice if I, if, if I, if I follow that kind of life. Or what, I, what's, yeah, no good, no good can come of that. Or if I try, they'll make a show out of me. <laughs> well, I think it is a warning to women who might uh, uh, stick up uh, like a like a nail sticking out that you will be pounded down and you will be pounded down even after you're dead. So you better not try to stick up and have a voice. Right. Well, they can't stop me, I guess. <laughs> well, some of us will keep speaking, you and me and 
Well, I think I think there there are many empowered women who do have yes. a voice and are vocal, yes. and I think that's why uh, you know Hollywood wants to push back on them. They're trying. They're trying to stifle a lot of women. I know there are a lot of women still in the Eagle Forum that are doing great work. I've met them, and they're wonderful people. So the the last thing that I wanted to touch on was just how cold and calculated they have this betrayal of Phyllis. And it's, it's really evident in every betrayal on the anti-ERA side. The infighting between the feminist is there. And I would say some people would say, well, okay, this show is fair because they show infighting between the feminist as well. The popularity contest between Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan. But I do not accept Betty Friedan being served up on a silver platter because every infighting that they do on the feminist side, it's because they believe it is right and it is just. And the infighting on the anti-ERA side is cold and calculated. Did you notice the same? I did. I think you're absolutely right. And so a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the show with a cousin of mine who would doesn't agree with a single word my mother ever said. But she said to me, because she's not seen the show, she said to me, well, I hope they captured her, her charisma and her graciousness and her magnetism. And I said, no, that's what they missed. And my cousin was just appalled because she said, she said, I love talking to your mother. That's sweet. Well, that, that speaks to who she was and mm-hmm. in, in real life and how wonderful of a person she must have been if somebody who didn't agree with her politically could still say those things. So, yes, the warmth, like you said, was just completely missing. Mm-hmm. And humor. And they humor. also miss yeah. the humor. But, you know, the feminists are kind of known for not having a sense of humor. So maybe when they read the lines of my mother, they didn't realize they were, they were funny. <laughs> well, and, and the ones that, uh, the lines that were supposed to be funny, I thought were the, the funniest was actually at Betty Friedan's expense where they made her look pretty uh, narcissistic. And they did make her look power hungry as well, but they did it in such a humorous way that you didn't, recognize it as such when I felt sorry for Betty in that depiction I kind of did too Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's different for me I'm not used to feeling sorry for Betty for Dan but (laughs) but I kind of did a little bit Mm -hmm. Uh, wasn't there a a biography the person who wrote the biography said that they didn't like the show was it the so there are two biographies done of my mother. The first one uh, was done by a, a Chicago reporter, and it's called The Sweetheart of the Silent Majority. And that reporter, Carol Felsenthal, uh, was the uh, historical advisor on the show and was credited and paid for her work on the show. The second biographer uh, is Don Critchlow, and his biography is called Phyllis Schlafly and Grassroots Conservatism. And um, he is uh, very upset at the historical inaccuracies on the show and has uh, talked about that in some interviews with the media uh, because he, he was not a he did not do a social biography of her. He did a biography based on the historical record. So for example, um, much is made uh, in one episode that, you know, you know that the, the Phyllis uh, had, uh, or her organization was aligned with the Ku Klux Klan. And so he's taken that on because it's, it's patently ridiculous. This charge was made by Betty Friedan. There's no uh, historical um, um, uh, evidence for any of it. Uh, in fact, they make up a fictional character, a leader in Louisiana named Mary Francis. Well, the you know the leaders in Mary Fr- uh, in Louisiana at that time were Charlotte Felt and Marilyn Thayer, and you know n- nothing could be further from the truth of what they've of the words that they've put in their mouths. And, and of course, the, the real telling thing is that my mother was Roman Catholic, and the Ku Klux Klan was, was anti-Catholic to its fiber. And so the idea that she would have aligned herself with an organization that was so anti-Catholic is ridiculous. But that's how they promote the slurs uh, in, in, in 
contradiction to the historical record because they want the slur out there. Right. Well, it's good that he was talking about the show and setting some of the record straight. So I will probably have to cut this conversation off now because it is getting to dinner time and just like six so o'clock. <laughs> yes. Remember we have dinner. Yes. Dinner is at six. <laughs> yes. I, we will have be having dinner at six as well. We're having beef bourguignon. So yum. So that's in the that's in the oven. Have you been doing any cooking lately? Well, ev now that everyone is sheltering in place, we're cooking every night. You know, there's no restaurants open, and yeah. uh, we all, uh, at least, uh, you know, there's uh, there's still a lot of shutdown going on, and I think everybody's is rediscovering uh, family time and uh, and the dinner hour. I hope there may be some benefits to this shutdown. What is your favorite thing that you've cooked recently? Because I know you're a good cook. Well, I do enjoy food. It is a it is a pleasure uh, in life. Uh, there's no there's no doubt about that. Um, one of the things I love to make is homemade pasta, and so uh, I made recently a uh, lasagna. And if you make homemade pasta, what's really nice is lasagna because you don't have to boil the noodles. They're so moist, and you just roll them out thin and lay them in the, in the pan. And so the filling was a combination of uh, mushrooms, onion, bacon, and asparagus. Yum. That sounds amazing. And then it had a um, custard filling rather than uh, with uh, fontina cheese and then baked in the oven. And I like to do a breadcrumb topping so you get that kind of crunchy topping. Oh, that sounds really good. I'm going to have to make that. Did you take the pictures in the cookbook? Some of them. I thought is it? Those are some of the food pictures. Yeah, I have to work on my food styling. They looked good. <laughs> Lighting is my is my downfall. Um, I can get the food on the plate to look good. Mm -hmm. Lighting when taking a picture is just. You kind of have to have professional lighting if you want to. Well, I can see you've got really good lighting on your face, and I'm looking and realizing that I, I, my lighting on my face isn't as good for the Zoom oh, pictures good. it should be. That's always the challenge talking. with the new thing. Well, it's a little, it's getting dark here because we're having a storm, so it's oh. I, the, my ambient lighting is going down. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for coming on again and talking with me. A, Third time, I am the luckiest person in the world. Lacey, it's, it's been, a pleasure. This has been really self-indulgent for me to get to ask you all these questions. So I really appreciate it. You are most welcome. And thank you. And I, maybe we'll talk again someday. I hope so, Lacey. All right. All right. You take care. Thank you. Certainly. Bye-bye.